maybe a hundred thousand. Um, and, and a document probably has a thousand or so. So storing this matrix has a hundred thousand columns. You don't want to store all of them. Um, and even clustering some similar ones together may get you down to maybe, maybe 10,000. But you may only want to store something on the order of a thousand. Um, and, and the clustering may not even get you to 10,000. Maybe it's 30 or 40,000. So it's still a really big number. Um, OK, so. Is this a bad idea to do random uh, hashing because you're going to land with your card similarity being way off if you use that? Yeah, so, so I, I'm actually not advocating that you do this, this, this hash cluster. Uh, I wanted to give kind of a, so an example of, of uh, something that, that isn't going to work so, so well. So when you see the next thing, hopefully you're even more amazed that it actually works well. Um, so, uh, so, so, so hopefully you, you, you find the next thing called min hashing even, even cooler now that you can kind of see why this, this doesn't work. Um, so it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty clever idea uh, that I think was kind of, when it happened, it was, it was, it was kind of out of the blue. And um, so we're going to talk about a technique called min hashing. Um, and this was basically developed by Andre um, Roeder. Um, I think this is like the mid 90s. And uh, so he was one of the core basic engineers in the Altaverse, um, um, in the AltaVista search engine. And they used this min hashing. This, this was one of the key computational techniques they did to really speed up that search engine. And I don't know if any of you remember the, the like the days before Google, but um, so uh, back then, um, the, so you know the, the search engine AltaVista was actually one of the top search engines, and it was doing you know, all this great stuff. But they were the web was growing so fast, their algorithms you know scaled pretty well, but they had to keep doing optimizations. Like I've heard stories of them optimizing stuff they code every night just to keep up with the growth of the web and their crawlers and stuff. Um, and then Google came along and changed everything. Um, but pre-Google, this was like the state of the art. And this technique is still used inside of these, uh, these, these big companies like Google and Yahoo and so forth. Um, OK, so, so, so after all this buildup, you're probably, hopefully, hopefully you're a little bit curious now, right? OK, at least everyone's, most people are paying attention. That's good. So the first step is we're going to um, randomly um, permute um, the elements. <coughs> so in this example here, let's do, um, I'm going to rewrite this, this matrix as um, 2, 5, 6, 1, 4, 3. And then I'm going to so it, one thing about one thing about a matrix is that if you permute the rows and columns, you're not really changing the structure at all. So I can randomly permute these elements without changing any of the information. I'm just changing the names of how I'm sorting them on. So I've chosen the way to sort them at random. And let's see one is here. So that was that was the first step. Um, step two is going to be to record the first element um, in each set. Okay, so set one. So after I've done the random order, the first one in set two is two. The 
first one, in, I mean, first one set one is two, first one set two is three, the first one set three is two, and the first one set four is six. Okay. So, so this is still um, very simple, and we'll call this as some function m, this based on this random permutation. So using that RAM permutation. And so then um, step three isn't, isn't really a step, but it's... Um, now we're going to have the property that um, the probability that um, M of SI equals M of SJ, this holds for any set I and J, this is going to be equal to the Jacquard similarity between set i and set j. So this is a pretty pretty cool fact, right? So I've done this. I've reduced the I've reduced the uh, um, all the elements down to a single number and. The probability that they are the same number for two sets is equal to the Jacquard similarity. So I have, so I have the right. So what's going to happen is I'm now estimating the Jacquard similarity between two sets as either a zero, uh, um, as, as either a zero or a one. Right? I'm going to say the Jacquard similarity is a one if they have the same numbers, S1 and, S1 and S3, or a zero, S1 and S2, if they have different things. But the right expected value by my estimate, that my expected value of my estimate is going to be exactly the Jacquard similarity. So this means that, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty rough estimate, right? It's zero or one, um, but it's, but it's, I haven't, but it's exactly the right probability. Um, so why is it true? Okay, so I'll, uh, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to go through the proof. Next. Okay. So yeah, I, have, I have time. So let me go through the, the proof of why this is true. Um, yeah. question. So you're going to permit randomly on M. Wouldn't that be an issue because if your data is stored on the computer and if you're randomly permuting the data set, then you're like not using the temporal and spatial locality of the cache, and then you're technically is the performance will go down significantly. Right. So, so this is the easiest way to see the algorithm. Well, well, after I go through the proof, I'll show a faster way of actually of processing this. Okay. So, so the random one. Th this is not how you'd actually process it, but it's it's a little bit simpler to to, to see this way. So maybe while I'm going through the proof, you can think about how to do this more efficiently. Okay. Um, okay. So, so let's see. Um, the proof. Okay. There, there are going to be three. Um, so, so we're, we're going to do this with respect to some set S i and some set S j. There are going to be three types of of elements. So x is going to be um, it's um, it's one in, in in both sets. So this element is a, contained in S i and S j. Y is um, one in just one set, and z in um, zero in both sets. So. Usually in large data sets, almost all of them are Z. But if you look at the Jacquard similarity, the Jacquard similarity is, is going to be um, SI SJ is going to be equal to the, um, I'll write this, this will be the number of sets of type X over the sets of type X union the sets of type Y, right? The ones of type Z don't factor into the Jacquard similarity at all. Only the ones of type X and Y. Am 
right? So now, um, let's see. Um, So now let um, row R equals to um, min of M S I M S J. Right? So it's the minimum of these two values. So if it's um, so if it's S1 and S2. Um, it's not actually the, these numbers, maybe that's a bit confusing, but it's whichever one the, the row is sorted first. So this is 2. If it's between set 4 and set 2, right, the minimum is going to be 6, because 6 occurs before 3. So it's the minimum of these two. Okay, so, um, so and in this row, this is either type x, or y, right? So it's so this row is either going to be type x or it's going to be type y, and so the um, and so it's type x with probability um, all the ones of type x over all the ones of type x and all the ones of type y, right? Because if well, we only worry about the ones of type X or of type Y, and so the probability of type X is, you know, of that set, the ones of type X. That's, that's exactly the probability. But this is also exactly the Jacquard similarity. Right? So the probability that's of type X, which means you get a 1, is exactly what the Jacquard similarity. And the probability of type Y is 1 minus <coughs> this. That's when you get a 0. And that's you know uh, that's one minus the Jacquard similarity. Right. Does this this make sense? You look like you still have a little bit of a question. You're, you still don't quite believe it. Okay. So. If we're just going to use the estimator, the indicator that ms1, msi, and msj are equal, why wouldn't we just create like however many ms we want and then do you know like a lot of large numbers? Yeah, um, exactly. Right. That's what we're going to do next. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So good, good. So, um, so it means you're paying attention the the first week, right? So, so what we're going to do is, so, um, I'm going to repeat. This is that now that we have, have a good estimator, we can create this random permutation. And it estimates oh, um, it, it estimates the Jacquard similarity exactly. Right? So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna do this a bunch of times and take essentially take the average, count how many times we're successful, how many ones we get, on which permutations we get a one, and count how many of those we have. And this will be a, a good estimate of the Jacquard similarity. Um, and so we can actually use the Chernoff bounds, the Chernoff Hofke bounds we talked about to analyze, see exactly how many of these permutations we need in order to get um, in order to get a good estimate. So let me just Let me see how far I can go here. Um, okay, so we're going to consider k um, different um, permutations. We're going to call these m1, m2, m2, m k. And so, so for, what we're going to say is for, um, for any ji and you know, or for any set one, set two, we're going to have k um, random uh, variables. 
let's say that x, so um, x1 through x2 up to xk. And so xi is going to be um, exactly, um, is, is going to be 1 if mi of s1 equals mi of s s2 and 0 um, otherwise. Right? And so then we're going to have an estimator m, which is going to be the sum of i equals 1 to k of all these xi's. And so this will be our estimate of the Chicard similarity. And what we know is that the expected value of <coughs> xi minus the, um, the Jacquard similarity is equal to 0. And we also know this is between 0 and 1, so we can use a turn of up. So it's, it's bounded. So, so basically, by, by applying the turn of popping down, you can, you, you can get something that says the, the probability that our estimate m um, minus the Jacquard similarity, um, the probability that this is greater than, than epsilon, some parameter epsilon error, is going to be less than delta if we set k equals to uh, 2 over epsilon squared natural log of 2 over delta. And so if, if you want to kind of confirm this, you can go back and look at the churn of hopping bounds and, and plug everything in. But, but this is you know, a very direct application of it. Right, so we get these random variables by all these permutations. We, we take, um, actually, this is 1 over k. We take the average of all of them, and uh, we know that the expected value differs from the Jacquard similarity is zero. Um, so that means, and because they're bounded, we can apply this um, this turn off Hawking bound and get that the probability that you have more than epsilon error is less than delta. So it's got this this two-sided type of error that, that we that we saw. So it means if you have about one over epsilon squared of these. Um, of, of these uh, um, of these permutations, then you can get about at, at most epsilon error with with some some delta one minus delta probability. So this is actually still a pretty um, this is actually still a pretty big number. Um, so if you want to get within um, ten percent error and Let's let's ignore this this log n term here, um, or let's just say this log n term is five, right? If you want to get at most ten percent error and the log n term is five, then how many permutations do you need? What? Um, yeah. Right, so it's going to be a thousand, right? So, so ten percent error um, is 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 equal to about epsilon equals one over ten. Is it? Is one ten? Is the probability? Is what that corresponds to? And that means that k is going to be equal to one over was well, is going to be one over one over ten. That's ten squared times 2, and this is times, let's say the log term is 5. So 10 squared is 100 times 2 times 5 is equal to 1,000. But th this is still much better than if our dictionary is 100,000 terms, right? This is still a lot better. And that's if you're doing individual words. If you're doing shingles instead of, um, in instead of words in the dictionary, then maybe instead of 100,000, it's what is it, 100,000 squared, which is something pretty big. What is that, 10 billion? 10 zero. 10 zero. So that's, that's big. That's not something you want to store. Right? <coughs> now, maybe storing the, um, but 1,000 is, again, on the order of the size of these documents, web pages. They, they, may be, they may be smaller than this, but it's also 
It's also a fairly, maybe a, a simpler representation to work with. You just have this list of numbers that you have to compare in order to see what the Jakar similarity is. You see if the numbers match up. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so again, you can then represent, so, so what, this, what this happens is if you do these k permutations, what's happening is that you're converting the sets, each set goes into a um, vector of, of numbers. So you, you've converted between abstract representations again here. The sets are not as necessarily as easy to work with. Um, to look up whether something is in a set or not, you have to build a day structure on top of it. And if I do that, but with the vectors, you just compare like elements, right? So, um, so you know, this is the first element of S1 is two. The first element of S2 of, of S2 is three, right? If I have if I had a, had a different permutation then the next element of the vector, index 2, would be whatever value is here and so forth. So you can think of creating a vector to represent each set. And so, you know, at the examples I'm doing on the board, this, this is not very useful, right? But on really big documents, when you're, when you're crawling the web, um, this, is, this is much, much more useful. Um, so, but I mean, the algorithm I've described here, like, like you're mentioning, is, is way too slow. I'm not going to construct the matrix and then construct a permutation of the matrix and then search in the matrix to find the first element. This this is this algorithm is ridiculous, right? So if you if you if you coded this up and said it's running too slow, what's going wrong? I you know I'd, you'd say okay, well, we need we need to think about about how to how to do this better. Um, so what we're going to have is I'll keep my example up just in case I need it, but um, the thing we're going to have is I'm going to not tell you how to do this, but we're going to have a set of k um, hash functions that are going to go so you know, h1, h2, hk, and hi is going to go from n to n. And this is where you have n. You have n elements where you have n. So we have, we have some way of, of mapping some object in our set to some random number. Now this, this doesn't even need to be between you know, 1 and big N. It can just be some sort of value that we can sort. Right? It doesn't need to explicitly be this big number. Um, I mean, we need to have it essentially up to the right precision, um, but it can be like a random number between 0 and 1 as long as it's consistent. Um, and if, if we finish early today, maybe I'll talk about hash functions today. If not, I'll talk about them on, on Wednesday, um, about good ways of, of doing this. But so, so, so let's assume that I've given you these hash functions. Now, how can I quickly compute the vector representations of the sets. So I want to go directly to this vector representation, where this is one instance of it, right? We're going to write a little bit of um, pseudocode on the board here. Have any, any ideas how this would work? Okay, let me give you a hint. We're going to start with, um, so, um, what, we're going to 
Um, let's see. So. We're going to start with um, let's see for all of the sets. So well, let me say, let me just tell you how many sets I have. Um, well, okay. Well, what we're going to do is just on one on one set. Okay, and we're going to set um, k counters convert this one set into this vector representation. But I'm going to do it for all of these hash functions. So what I do for, for all um, s element s in the, in the set, I'm going to have a for loop. Right? Um, and so um, And then for each i in <coughs> i in k, is less than, than counter i, then I just I'm going to set counter i equal to So and then the output is right. So you see how this works? I just make a pass over the elements in the set, and I apply this hash function to them. And if it's smaller than the counter, then I I set the counter as the minimum. This is this is count. Uh, um, the clue is this is called min hashing, right? So I'm I'm going to hash it to something, and then keep the min of the things I've hashed. To. So I keep I, I'm I'm keeping the minimum of all the elements in the set, and I just make one one pass over them each element in the set. If it's smaller than my counter for that hash function, um, then I keep that value. So I always end up with with the minimum value that something hashed. And so this takes, I make linear time pass over the elements in the set, and you know I have k for loops for each element. And so even if the set is big, k may not be too big, it'll fit in memory, so it's going to be fast for the cache to optimize, right? I'm, I don't need to keep pulling the, the sets from memory over and over, or from, from disk over and over. Um, but each, each set will typically be small to fit in memory. But, um, so is anyone so, so is this is this clear? Maybe I should go through 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 an example. Um, so if if I just went through the example with this, so this permutation is is my hash function, right? So my my hash function maps in in this case, if this is hash one, it's it's going to map um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Element one is going to be mapped to location four, two to location one, three to location six, four to location uh, five, five to location two, and six to location uh, three. Right. So now, if I'm going through, let's say, I'm going through set number uh, number three, what I do, I process two, this one. Uh, that's a bad example. Okay. Let me try something more interesting. I process four. Uh, so, so I process one. 
So initially, my counter one is equal to infinity. I process one and see one now to four. So that means my counter one is equal to four after this point. Two's not on the set, three's not on the set. I, I see four, which is in the set. Um, four maps to five. Um, so five is is um, is larger than four, so, so it means I don't do anything, right? Um, that this value is larger than the counter, so I don't do anything. Um, and then five is not in the set, and then six is in the set. Six maps to three. Three is less than four, so my counter is now three. And the output of this is now for set four was element six, which was in the in the third location. <coughs> So, and, I, and this for loop is just so I do it with all of the different uh, hash functions at the same time. But it's, it's um, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a pretty simple algorithm. Um, it's efficient to do in practice, and it can give you a good representation of your sets that allow you to quickly uh, estimate the Jacquard similarity. Okay, so um, that makes sense to everyone? Any questions? So maybe you have a question of, so, yeah. I don't think how you're doing all the hash functions at the same time. So I'm, I start by creating a set of hash functions, right? So I have <coughs> some way of doing this. And, uh, and so then, I'm going to keep a different counter. The k different counters are for the k different hash functions. And so I only went through an example for one hash function. Well, let's say I had a different hash function which had permutation 1, 6, 3, 4, 2, and 5. Right? So let's say this was m1 and this is m2. Right? So then as I process this one at the same time, I have c2 equals infinity, c1. Now 4 is going to map to location 4, so C2 equals 4. Here when I get to, oh wait, this was 1, sorry. So 1, 1 map to location uh, 1, so this is the minimum here. Uh, C2, 4 is going to map to location uh, 4, which is larger than this, so I keep it 1. And 6 is going to map to location 2, which is larger than 1, so I keep this equal to 1. So you end up with the set of all the counters. Yeah, so I'm going to get a set of these counters, and so if this is, if k was equal to 2, then my representation for set 4 is going to be mapped to this vector. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> is, say vector 4 is going to be equal to 3, 1 is a representation. And then if I compared it, let's say um, vector three, um, let's see, the first element was, was equal to two, and then the second element, let's see, I have two is going to be five, uh, three is going to be, um, three is three, Okay, so three is my counter, so four is equal to, uh, four is equal to four, so still three, and six is equal to two, so six. Yes, six. So now, S vector three is six, so the Jacquard similarity estimate between these is now still zero. But even more, it's gonna approach what the true similarity is, which, Hopefully, is two fifths. Um, if I did that correctly. Right. So, okay. So, um, um, so what we've we done so far in this, in here, we've we've taken, we've talked how to take a, a full document, represent it in various ways based on how we choose to model it as a representation as a set, 
Um, then we showed this, this hash function, uh, which approximately represents it as, as this vector. Seems like we've, we've, we've done a lot of work, and we haven't really gotten any closer to our goal, which was to figure out which of the documents are more similar to each other, and to do this quickly. We, we now have a way of defining how similar they are, um, but we haven't figured out how to do this quickly yet, how to find all the similar documents. And so on Wednesday, we'll do something called uh, um, locality sensitive hashing, which is going to be using this vector representation to quickly find all the documents which are close. It's, so it's going to be like a hash function here, um, but it's going to have the property that things which are similar, vectors which are similar, are going to map to the same bin more likely, and vectors which are not similar, like these two, are going to map to bins which are far away from each other. Um, and so we're going to explicitly use this, this vector representation to do that. So that's why we went to the trouble of converting it from a set to a matrix and then to a vector, because this vector representation will, will be what's very useful in doing this little <coughs> sense of action. So. OK, great. So, Remember, homeworks are due tomorrow at the start of class. Um, Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday at the start of class. Uh, <laughs> finally, European. Tomorrow at the start of class. <laughs> when it comes to details about homework, <laughs> you get 